Well, hello, welcome to the channel. My name is Johnny and you're watching Hillbilly Modeling. So you clicked on this video because you want to know a little bit about craft paints being used in modeling. And uh, also we're going to be talking about uh, mixing paints as well because a lot of you are interested in uh, values and uh, color saturation and the actual ratios uh, that I use. <laughs> and uh, well, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, I just mix until I get the color I want. <laughs> but that's kind of haphazard. Uh, <laughs> so there is a device to help us. Whoops, upside down. There we go. And this is called a color wheel. So we're going to be talking about the color wheel and how to use it as well. So the reason why I use craft paints is because of the value that I find in them and also the flexibility that these craft paints give me in being able to get the look that I want from my model. Uh, going to cost, and you'll probably recognize this type of paint. Uh, this is Tamiya, or Tamiya, whichever way you prefer to uh, pronounce it. Uh, Cost-wise, uh, this is the large jar, which is... Um, how many ounces we got here? Is this 23 ounces? Probably should have put my glasses on earlier, huh? Uh, yeah, this is... Oh, I'm sorry. This is 23 milliliters, okay? And this is the large jar of paint from Tamiya, and it can run you anywhere from five to eight dollars, uh, plus tax and shipping here in the United States, um, to get this color paint. And also, uh, they come in a smaller jar, which is 10 milliliters, right? And so 10 milliliters will usually run you two dollars and fifty cents to as much as five bucks, depending upon where you get it. And um, it's only 10 milliliters, which is a one-third ounce. When you go to craft paints, what you get, and these are acrylic water-based craft paints, which has its own advantage. Uh, uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, these are two fluid ounces, okay? So that's 59 milliliters. As you can see, uh, 59 milliliters versus the 10 milliliters. There's a lot more paint that you can use, and <laughs> which is uh, volume can be a real asset, especially if you're mixing your own colors. If you mix up a batch that doesn't do what you want it to do for whatever reason, either you got it too thin or you did, don't like the shade that you mixed, uh, it's not financially detrimental <laughs> that you wasted a batch of paint. So that's number one. Uh, and these, you usually get them anywhere from, say, $1.67 to, uh, uh, you can catch them on sale for under 70 cents. So there are different brands of them, of course. This is Anita's, which I really love this stuff. And it's a Rust-Oleum product, as you can see there. Uh, which I think, I'm not sure, don't quote me on it, but I think Anita's has been bought out by Crafter's Collection or something like that, so the name may change on it. Uh, I'm not real sure yet. I couldn't find a lot of information on that. Uh, and then there's, of course, Apple Barrel, which you're going to find in all your big box stores. And uh, we have another one here somewhere, all oh, Folk Art, which is another one that you'll see. Um, and if you're worried about having to mix paint, well, if you're using craft paint, you really don't have to worry about that too much because there is a plethora of different, that, that's a hillbilly word for you, by the way, plethora of different colors and shades that you can get that's already pre-mixed, and all you have to do is prepare it for your airbrush. Now, the layout in most hobby stores, uh, this one is my local Hobby Lobby, as you can see here. Um, it's usually very similar, depending upon which store you go to, like Michael's or even uh, Joanne Fabrics. They have craft paints, and there's a couple of other uh, craft stores uh, that have uh, these type of craft paints. Uh, now, I will stress that this... Um, uh, particular video is all about these flat, uh, regular uh, acrylic water-based uh, craft paints. So as you can see here, uh, they 
have so many different <laughs> colors and shades and I mean any brown or red or uh, color that you can imagine as you can see here uh, my favorite the Anita's are marked down to 49 cents so they, they are eliminating this in my local hobby store and I don't really have a real modeling hobby store uh, so if I get uh, paints like Tamiya or Vallejo uh, those have to come uh, through the mail you know or through the through the UPS man <laughs> yeah, he's my buddy <laughs> and uh, being able to use these craft paints though keeps me from having to uh, uh, take and uh, order stuff and wait on it and as you can see there some of these paints are $1.17 you know uh, some of them's 99 and these are all the uh, two ounce bottles too so good selection and of course there is one other advantage uh, this particular type of uh, acrylic paint is a solvent based paint which means that you're going to have to use their brand of uh, uh, thinner to to mix with this whereas with a water based you can actually use water to mix with it or you can use any of the airbrush thinners that are designed for water-based acrylic paints. And I like using the Vallejo because I use Vallejo paints as well, which are water-based. And I don't have to keep different types or worry about the thinner that I'm using. That just makes it more simple for me. The biggest advantage is uh, using water-based is you don't have all those fumes that you can get from a solvent-based type acrylic paint. And cleanup is a lot easier. So once I buy my acrylic paint, what do I do with it? Well, it's going to be way too thick for you to spray in your airbrush. And uh, you can paint brush this uh, pretty effectively. And I have. And I get good results with it. Um, but when it comes to the airbrush, you're going to have to thin this. And one of the biggest questions out there is, what does that look like? How much do I thin it? And there's a lot of advice out there, uh, one of them being, <laughs> you need to thin this to the consistency of milk. Uh, so what does that look like? I don't know about you, but I don't drink whole milk. Uh, I drink 2%, and there's also 1%, and I guess there's buttermilk, <laughs> uh, almond milk, and all kinds of other milks out there. So what does that look like? So we're going to go ahead and mix up some, and we're just going to use this olive green right here. And we're going to mix up a jar of this, and so I can show you what that consistency really needs to look like to use in your airbrush. And the airbrush that we're going to be using um, as a uh, benchmark is going to be the Neo. Let me find my Neo. There we go. <laughs> this is a Iwata. Neo airbrush and it comes uh, prepackaged with a 0.35 millimeter tip. Okay, so that's the size of the hole that the paint's going to go through. Uh, some airbrushes have very large tips, uh, like a 0.5, I think, is one of the largest. Uh, and then you can get really small ones too. I don't know how far they go down, but I think at least 2.2. And that is going to really determine the consistency. But as a benchmark, we're just going to use this airbrush, uh, which is a very good, versatile uh, airbrush to use. And uh, it's orifice for the, uh, for the needle, the actual hole that the paint's coming out of, is uh, 0.35 okay, of a millimeter. So the first thing we're going to need, other than the paint, is something to mix our paint in and I'm just going to use this mixing jar right here now this mixing jar is a master airbrush three-quarter ounce glass jar bottle and you can buy these in a pack of 10 they run uh, I think $17 roughly uh, from Amazon and you can probably get these uh, from different sources but these are the ones I really like the paint doesn't stick to them and the uh, uh, consistency of having the same volume uh, really helps me in my paint mixing so trying to stay as standard as possible especially if uh, you're you're mixing for your airbrush so we'll just take our jar and what I like to do 
uh, before I put the paint in the jar and just put a little splash of uh, thinner in the bottom because these thick craft paints like to stick to the bottom. It makes it a little bit harder to mix up. So it's just very, very little uh, in there just to wet the bottom. So we're going to add a little bit of paint. Uh, there we go. It's a little thick. There we go. So we got a little bit of paint. <laughs> it's a little stringy. Uh, that happens because every time you use paint out of a bottle, and it doesn't matter what brand you use, you're going to introduce air into the bottle, and that will cause a little bit of drying to occur. It doesn't matter how much you shake it. That is never going to go away, but there there is a way to uh, minimize that. And then we can add our thinner. Start off with just a little bit, and I'm just going to use the end of my stir stick here. Scrape it off the bottom. We want to mix this up as good as we can. So this is very little paint. Uh, we're not a whole lot here. And we're going to check our consistency. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to put some paint up on the side and see how it runs down. Right there, that is nice. That is a good, that is good consistency right there. So that's nice. That's going to work for us. So in my experience, that, that is the best uh, consistency uh, or viscosity uh, of the paint that we're going to need for our airbrush. Gives us good coverage. And um, there is going to be one little issue, and that, that's going to be that uh, just like you saw before, uh, it can get a little stringy, and all paints will start to dry once you introduce air into the bottle. Uh, one way to stop that, of course, is to, uh, every time you open your bottle, put a little bit of nitrogen in there. But if you're like me, you don't have nitrogen standing by. So <laughs> um, that can be a problem when we're spraying it through our airbrush. So what we're going to do to minimize that is we're going to strain the paint as we pour it into our airbrush. So when it comes to straining paint, you can get these. Now these are for automotive use. Um, this uh, particular uh, strainer uh, came from Harbor Freight. Now, very inexpensive. You can get a box of a hundred of these for like eight bucks. So that's, that's not bad at all. But we don't need all this paper. It's kind of in our way. So we'll just cut that open, and what we're after is the screen. And we'll just go pull the screen out. And I often do this while I'm watching YouTube to prepare things for uh, painting, and we're not going to need that paper anymore for it. And then we're going to go ahead and cut this. And that gives us two screens for screening our paint. And what this is going to do is this is going to get rid of all of those uh, large particles that could interfere with the operation of our paintbrush because remember the orifice on it is really small or the, the tip, I'll just call it a tip, <laughs> is very small. So when we go to put this in and, and use it for our airbrush, we actually need to get something that we can actually pour paint through. So we will just take this mesh and we're going to fold it into a little funnel. There we go. And that right there is going to allow us to pour it into our airbrush. So then we'll take our airbrush. Oh. The next thing we need to do 
Now you don't have to do this, but I, I, I do like to do this because I tend to get a little messy with our paint. So I just fold up a piece of a, a paper towel, whatever you use, that's fine. We've got our paint ready for us. And I will wrap this around my airbrush, that way I don't get paint all over the place. Now I've seen people pour the uh, actual paint down a paintbrush, you know, shaft, <clears throat> but that doesn't work very well for me either. And, and it's going to depend upon how much paint you got in the bottle too. So we need to strain this paint, that way we don't have any large particles, it's going to cause problems with our airbrush. And uh, we just simply dump it in. And as you can see here, I am using a uh, clothespin, wooden clothespin, to do this. And we'll just allow the paint to strain right on through. Another helpful thing to have is an, a little medicine bottle of some kind. This is, it doesn't matter what it is. It's just something to actually put your paint screen into so that you don't have paint dripping all over the place. And you can just set that aside. So that's very little paint, but that's more than enough to do what we're going to do. So I've got this piece of uh, polystyrene here, and we are actually going to go spray this in the spray booth and see what kind of coverage we got and see how well it works. So this is an unprimed, uh, no primer paint whatsoever, on a, uh, a piece of styrene here, polystyrene sheet, uh, just a small section. And if you've ever used water-based acrylics before, you know that your very first coat that goes on to a, uh, say, virgin polystyrene needs to be just a light coat like you see here. And then I use the airbrush to go over it, just, to, uh, just putting the air on it to kind of dry it. And that gives a little bit of grip for the paint. And then we can start building our color. And all acrylics uh, will do this. Uh, on fresh plastic or polystyrene, um, even if you're using a, an acrylic um, primer, which I use the Vallejo primers most of the time, uh, you, you have to do it the same way. So here we are. Uh, that is a nice coverage. It's a good color. We don't have any spots or speckles or anything to, to worry about or sand out later, so that looks really, really good. And it's got a really nice flat uh, uh, texture to it. I think that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, so yeah, that's why I use these craft paints. Now, that was just a little bit of craft paint. As you can see, of course, it's going to get darker as it dries, uh, which is usually what happens with all paints. So that's nice. Now, I did do a little experiment. I went and took our screen here that we strained our paint through, and I ran some warm water through it. And as you can see, it's still wet. But these are the particles that we screened out. Remember that stringiness that we had in our paint? And this just would not dissolve and mix as we mixed our paint. So that's the importance of uh, straining your paint. And, and you can get this uh, with any paint. It doesn't matter if you're talking about uh, Vallejo or, uh, uh, of course, Tamiya, which is solvent-based. Uh, you tend to have less of this problem with solvent-based paint, but however, that can still happen, and these particles will stop up that airbrush. And I always screen every uh, paint that I, that I use. That way I don't have a problem during my painting session. So I hope that that's helpful to you. So that's how I use these craft paints. Now, uh, one, one drawback to craft paints is that uh, you're not going to find a clear coat uh, to use on your model, uh, or I haven't found a clear coat uh, yet that I can use on my models. Uh, so I'm still using these uh, Model Master Acrylic Clear, uh, which this, this is the flat. This works really good. And of course, the Tamiya, I use the gloss. And then I do have to mix that with the uh, X20A thinner. Uh, 
And uh, this is a new one that I'm going to be trying out. Now, these are expensive. These are like eight bucks. <laughs> That's what it cost me anyway. Um, and of course, Vallejo has a whole range of paints. Uh, if you don't want to use craft paints, of course, you can use uh, other modeling paints, and that's that's not a problem, but uh, this is a uh, cheaper alternative, and it gives you a lot more flexibility. Uh, so I really like these paints. Uh, word of caution, anytime you are spraying acrylic paints, uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's Tamiya or Vallejo or these craft paints, uh, you do need to wear a mask or at the very minimum use a uh, a spray booth where it draws the air through and you're not breathing the particles and also of course uh, a benefit is that since you're not using solvent you don't have that thick heavy solvent smell because water well it doesn't really have a smell <laughs> so uh, that's a plus so next up uh, I want to introduce you to a color wheel this is a very useful tool and uh, I use it to get close to whatever it is that I, I want to mix. So we're going to talk about this, and uh, I'll show you the benefits of using a color wheel. So let's jump down on the bench and take a look at this thing. So our color wheel, it looks a little bit busy, but that's okay. What we're going to do is we're just going to separate out the items that we're going to be looking at. So there's our color wheel. And now we're going to zoom in on some information that's on our color wheel. Now, as you can see here, we've got color definitions. So primary colors is our red, yellow, and our blue. It cannot be mixed from any other colors. So those are the primary colors, as you can see at the top of our color wheel. On our outside disc here, we have our red, our yellow, and our blue. So next up, uh, we'll talk about secondary colors. That's when you take two primary colors mixed together, resulting in an orange, green, and violet. So those are your secondary colors. And then you have your uh, tertiary, <laughs> that's a hard word for me, uh, tertiary or intermediate colors, which is one primary and one secondary mixed together. And then it goes on to explain what an aggressive color is, which is your warm colors, your reds, your oranges, and your yellows, and then your receding or cool colors, which is your greens, blues, and violets. So your instructions are right here, and that's great. Uh, so I don't have to memorize all that. And then we come over here to the other side. It talks about a hue. That's a uh, another name for a color. Tint is white. Tone is gray. And shade is black. A key color is a dominant color in a color scheme or mixture. Neutral gray is a combination of black and white. And intensity or chroma is uh, the brightness or dullness of a color. And value is the lightness or darkness of a color. So if you need to know all that, it's right here and you don't have to go looking any further. So on the top of our color wheel, let's zoom back out a little bit. Oops, going the wrong way. There we go. You see that we got our red, our yellow, our blue, our white, and our black. Also on the bottom scale, which is very useful, you can see that we have these shades around the bottom. And this is our gray scale. And so at 100% black, you've got black. 100% white, you've got white. Pretty simple. And then in between, that would be value 6 and value 5 here, or 5 or 6, <laughs> whichever way you want to look at it, uh, that would be our neutral gray. Neutral gray is exactly half white and half black. So that helps you determine where on this scale, a certain part of paint is going to fall. And when we talk about parts of paint, uh, they may say three parts white and seven parts black. Well, that would be uh, three parts white, seven parts black would be this color here. Value three from black, right? So it's mostly black, 
with one with with three parts white in it so it would be that color there if it uh, is a light gray right and it is seven parts white and three parts uh, uh, black you should fall here around value eight so 50 50 which would be five five parts and five parts would be your neutral gray so you can also use this to determine how dark you want the other colors to be when you go to mix those. So now let's just look at the color wheel. And the way it's designed here is that, as you can see, this is the red, this is the red, red and red gets red. And if we want to mix blue and red, Red and blue is going to get this color here. And this would be violet. So where is violet on our color wheel? Whoops, I'm almost out of the frame, sorry. So <laughs> red and blue is going to get violet. And as you can find, violet's right there. Same thing, if we want to mix red and yellow, we get orange, which is a secondary color. And we will find our orange over here. If you take orange and you add white, you're going to get this color, which is almost a flesh tone color. And that's how you take and you decipher what's going to happen. So let's see. Yellow and blue in equal parts equals green. This green is that green. By adding white to your green, 50-50, you get this color green. By adding black to that green, you're going to get a darker green. So, whatever color you mix, find it on the wheel, and then you decide whether you're going to add it, add the black, which is, as we see right here, uh, black is a shade. And if you want to lighten it, you can use white, which is a tint. And that's how simple your uh, color wheel is and to help you determine what colors you, you want to paint. Uh, or you can use the hillbilly method and just guess at it. <laughs> but for those of you that would like to uh, determine uh, exactly what color you, you want to do, uh, for instance, take red, but you want it with a different um, shade, right? Kind of match this value to the color red that you want, and then you can kind of figure out, really easy, how many parts red you, you need to use and how many parts whichever other color that uh, you're, you're gonna throw in there. So if you want it mostly red, you're gonna be more towards the dark side, and then the lighter color which would be your secondary color that you're going to throw in, right? How many parts of that you're going to add to it? So it's really very simple, and it works very well. So what is the color that we use the most? Well, if you're doing military vehicles, probably olive drab. Olive drab is simply made up by yellow and black, and that'll get you a true olive drab. So let's go ahead and test this theory, <laughs> and hopefully this works out, uh, and, and see what we come up with there. So for this little demonstration, this is daffodil yellow. However, it's really, really close to yellow yellow. So I'm going to use that, and I'm going to be using this apple barrel uh, black. And we just got a little mixing palette right here. And the attempt, <laughs> if I get this right, it should come out awful close to what the color wheel is telling us it should, should be. A little bit of dry paint there. So I'm going to try, and this is not scientific in any way, shape, or form, to put equal amounts of black and yellow together here. Then we get our black, 
And you should shake these too. I've already shaken them so that you didn't have to watch me uh, shake and paint. And I think that's too much. That's too much. So, let me take some of that off. Might still be a bit much. But we're going to we're going to go ahead with this experiment. See how close I can come with the uh, it's still too much paint. Anyway, we're going to try to mix that. <laughs> you know, when the camera's rolling, things don't necessarily go the way you want them to. So black and yellow makes olive drab. Now the good thing about mixing your own olive drab colors is that every single vehicle that you've got on display that has olive drab is not the exact same color because different colors, different time periods. So we're getting this mixed up and uh, I got it all over the place, but anyway. I think I had a little bit too much black in there, which we kind of knew from the start. But that's getting fairly close to what that color should be with our yellow and our black. So that's a really nice olive, light olive drab. So we can also do the same thing with black and white. So let's go ahead and try that. Yeah, this is not very scientific, but we're we're going to give it a shot. <laughs> like that wicked laugh. So I'm trying to get equal portions. It's pretty close. Of black and white together, which should give us our neutral gray. That's that's what we were looking for here. So what we're looking for here, if we, we have a true 50-50%, which this is not true 50-50, but we should be able to put this on our uh, grayscale and find out where we're at and how close we are to our gray, true neutral gray. So we're actually a little bit closer there than we are there, but that would be like our neutral gray. And that's how you can use this color wheel. So there is a lot more on this color wheel than just what I've shown you today. Uh, we've got quite a bit of different shades and hues and uh, it telling you about your tint and your tone and your shadow. And as, as you play with this, you can get a good feel of where you need to be and the types of colors that you're mixing. So... Uh, this is a very useful tool. I do use it, and uh, it helps me get where I want to be uh, in uh, what color shade or hue of paint that uh, I want to apply to the model. So I guess that'll wrap it up for this video. Now, I'm not very, very good scientifically of getting our colors exactly dead on with the color wheel. Uh, but it is a very useful device to use and it'll help you to decide what colors to mix and what you need in order to get uh, the result that you're looking for. And then if you mix these in a mixing jar, a mixing jar, <laughs> um, later on you can go ahead and add whatever your thinner that you're going to use and uh, get the right consistency, consistency <laughs> to, to spray that paint. So I hope this video was helpful um, and there is a good cost balance in being able to mix your own paint and get the hues that you want. But there's a plethora of uh, craft colors that you can use uh, without having to mix your own paint anyway. So uh, give it a try and maybe you'll like it and uh, maybe you'll save some money. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, 
A special thanks to all my subscribers because of you guys that I put these videos out. I hope that this one uh, was helpful. And uh, let me know in the comments uh, what you think. Uh, also, uh, if you're new to the channel and you're not a subscriber, uh, maybe today I earned that subscription. And uh, you guys uh, stay safe. And uh, I'll see you in the next one.